welcome to Remain in the Race podcast, brought to you by 88 Live to Ride, with your hosts, Ryan Havens, Daniel Hillian, and Mitch Reynolds, where we're going to discuss all things family, life, racing, and outdoors, where all glory will be given to the one who created us. This is episode 21, and man, it is going to be a good one. It is good to be with y'all here, March 12th. Daylight savings time, which is the worst holiday ever, but I think we're done with it now. But, hey, in the room got Ryan Havens. How are you doing tonight, Ryan? Doing great, Super D. We have had, we got a great show lined up. Everybody's going to really enjoy it. And uh, mm-hmm. along with us here in the Frog Studios <laughs> is the one and only best therapist in Faulkner County. He can rehab your upper extremities. He wants nothing to do with the lower extremities. It's Mitchell the Rocket Reynolds. How you doing, Mitch? You got got that right. I I only do the upper body, but I'm good, Super D. What a great interview we got in store here with RJR. Um, But we're alive and kicking up here in the in the frog. In the frog. Yeah, Yeah, we did have to uh, move our recording just. uh, uh, again, we've got uh, a great interview coming up with with Rylan, and he was uh, got in late last night from the GNCC over there in Georgia. Made it to church this morning, mm-hmm. and uh, he was like, "Hey, man, any chance uh, we could do that at night?" And we were like, "Well, it's daylight savings time. That's a great idea." So uh, we got together and uh, made it happen. And man, it's going to be good. This is now. This is going to be a little bit longer episode than we've done in the past. Uh, Ryland's story is it's it's pretty awesome, man. Of of how God just has continued to work in his life, and at times when you didn't think it was, you didn't really know. Like, and we even mentioned it in there too. Like, God, are you listening? Are you up there working? You know, uh, and he kind of shares some of that. And it's it's wow, I'm stealing his thunder. I better quit. But uh, hey, sit tight because uh, you won't even you won't even know what's going on. Right yeah, it, it's going to go by fast. It's a it's a great conversation with Rylan. Uh, no Bible study. We've, we've kind of set this up to be uh, just kind of Rylan's story, but I promise you'll be blessed. And so uh, anything anything y'all got for our listeners before we, we jump into this thing? Let's get to it. Let's get to the, let's do let's it. Get to the meat of it. So. Hey, stick with us. We're going to catch a pit stop real quick, and then we're going to bring Rylan Johnson on. So y'all stay with us. Here at Remain in the Race, we're happy to be partnered with Chief Motorsports. He is top of the line graphic design. You can find them over on, on Facebook at Chief Motorsports for all your graphic needs. Hey, man, let's jump into this thing. We've kind of been teasing it for a while. We've got Rylan Johnson of RJR. He's one of our sponsors. He's one of our dearest buddies. friends, one of our buddies, man. Rylan, how are we doing tonight, bud? We're doing good, man. I'm I'm glad to be here. Um, I wish I was there with you guys. I uh, that was the original plan, you know, to be there. And uh, my world's just crazy right now. We just got back from the GNCC uh, early this morning, and uh, we had a little eventful weekend. So I had to wash the bike, and um, I got to pull a motor later. So. Uh, yeah, it, it's all good, man. Excited. Um, oh, yeah. so glad you are having me on. Yeah, man. And I know um, back several months ago uh, when we did Iron Man, like as soon as the race was over, uh, we're just standing around and you were like, hey, get out of the way. We're leaving. And I was like, oh, 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 OK. <laughs> and so that's the thing, man, Rylan, when it's time to go, you turn and burn. So uh, I'm glad we were able to like I said, wish we could have all been, you know, around the table together, but, you know, this is the next, next best thing. Yeah, yeah, I made it to church this morning, so. There you yeah. go. You got you to gotta turn and burn. Mm-hmm. Well, um, we had all of our early service people show up for the second service because they all slept in, so it worked out. <laughs> it worked out good with daylight savings or anything, but, but hey, man, uh, let's jump into this thing. So, uh, Mitch kind of put some of our questions together, so, Mitch. Let's get into it. Hey, so Rylan, you know, uh, you and I talked quite a few times and you just felt led to come on the podcast to to tell your story and the testimony behind, behind it. So tell us a little bit about it. Tell tell us a little bit about who Rylan Johnson is. Yeah, man. Um, it's kind of wild. You know, I've been a I've been a Christian since I was a little boy and um, it was kind of surreal like I I wanted to tell my story I feel like 
most of the time when people get on podcasts, like, you know, I listen to quite a few of the digging deep stuff and like Mike Walsh on there and, you know, different people that are, I'm not saying Mike's old, but he's a lot older than I am, you know? And, uh, so they've been there, done that. And, uh, I feel like I'm in the middle of my walk and growing up, like I always kidded around about, like, I don't have a testimony. I was saved as a, as a little boy, you know, I, I don't have no testimony. I just been to church my entire life. And, uh, that's all changed. I, uh, I feel like, um, you know, I'm excited in this podcast. We're going to get real. We're going to, we're going to talk about some, some deep times in my life. Uh, I'm only 28 years old and, uh, I've experienced a lot and, you know, God's seen me through it. Um, I've got a successful business. I'm still involved in racing. Like, man, I, I love life. I love where I'm at and I'm excited to share it. And, you know, maybe in another 20 years, I'll get to share, share more. Absolutely. Well, that's what you do. You just continue to accumulate me memories and, and uh, be appreciative of the blessings that God gives us. You know, it doesn't have to be a world changing testimony. You don't have to be a guy that is in drugs and, and, you know, on your last leg in prison to have a great testimony. We can all have a good testimony, you know, of coming to salvation. But from that, we know that there's much more to it than just coming to salvation. It's remaining in that, remaining uh, in that relationship with Christ. So we know that that relationship can ebb and flow and trials are going to come. And you're going to share some of those with us today, Rylan, and I'm looking forward to that. But we know as Christ followers that it's just all in us to to lean in on him, to depend on him and stay close in that relationship. And that's really ultimately what's going to bring us through. So that's a little yeah. kind of, you know, those are my thoughts as you're starting, starting to share that. But Rylan, tell us, you know, um, our relationship, all three of us with you goes way back. But uh, tell us, you know, I say you were born on a quad, but how did you get into racing? Yeah, man, it's, it's kind of crazy. So I got to tell a little bit of my dad's story because I'm second generation. So my dad, he started racing three wheelers. And uh, it's pretty crazy because, uh, Mitch, you know, uh, we've got a mutual friend, Jay, Jay Bergen, his his dad, uh, raced with my dad, and then Landon Williams, which he'll fit in my story, and we'll talk about him. But his dad, Tim Williams, uh, raced with my dad. And um, my dad actually became a local pro racing three-wheelers, and he is uh, – one of four children and he didn't have a dad growing up. So he, it was very tight. So he actually got a ride. Uh, I say it was a factory ride. It was not factory. It was just a, a guy with money that sponsored him because um, this guy was walking through the pits and seen my dad's three wheeler and it didn't have any rear plastic on it. They were, he had broke the rear plastic off and he couldn't afford plastic. So Everybody teased him, said he was no Fender Johnson. <laughs> and a uh, little bit later, the pro main event, and my dad's smoking everybody. So this guy come over afterwards. He's like, we're making, we were making fun of you earlier. But then we got to turning around, and, you know, there you are. You're smoking everybody. So we want to offer you this ride. And uh, so, yeah, my dad, he was a pretty local, you know, good local pro. And, and then uh, when he had – my sister and I, and, uh, you know, everything slowed down and, and he never pushed, pushed racing on me. Like it was, uh, just whatever I wanted to do. And, and actually my sister, she started riding when she was two years old and my dad kind of said it would come about, you know, if, if I ever wanted it. And they, at two, you know, they gave me the same, same amount of opportunity. I had a four wheeler before I was even born. Yeah. And he said, I didn't have any interest. And uh, at three years old, he said, one day I just come to him and said, I want to ride. And uh, it all, you know, it all started there. And um, it's kind of funny because it, you know, people that follow this podcast, uh, they'll, they'll go back to a few podcasts ago talking about us racing there at Sykeston. That was my first ever race. I was uh, five years old. It was 1999. And, uh, I raced a Suzuki 50 
and got waxed. I mean, <laughs> they killed me. So, yeah. So that was uh, that was that. That's how I got into it. I, that's that's funny because it sounds like every first race story that we hear, that's the common theme. We got waxed. So it's not the winning that gets us hooked. It's the competition. It's like once we get out there and get our butt kicked, it's like, okay, we're about to do something about this. But I want to step back just a little bit, Ryland. So so you mentioned your dad. For those people out there that don't know your dad, that's Mark, Mark Johnson. And Johnson ATV Supply uh, is the business that he started. Now, I don't remember what year he started that, Ryland, but it's been around as long as I can remember. Do you remember what year uh, that he started his business? Um, He's been in business, I think I was two months old when he went full-time for himself. So that would have been uh, in 94. So that'd be pretty much accurate then my claim that you were pretty much born on a quad in a, in a race yeah. shop. <laughs> um, you've yeah. always been around them. Uh, you know, Mark Johnson was critical in, in influencing Randy Bergen in racing, which ultimately led my dad to begin racing, which, you know, then I became a racer. So, you know, your dad is definitely influenced my dad too, because we had a four wheeler getting worked on at Mark's shop. And uh, something, and Mark was like, "Well, Jeff, Papa, hey, come, come do this race thing with us." And then here, here we are, twenty five years later, you know, still doing it. So Mark, Mark <laughs> yeah. is kind of the, I guess, the center point for all of you know, kind of all of us being connected. Man, that's crazy. I never put that together. He's the starting domino. Yeah. Once it, yeah. once he fell over, then uh, then all the rest of us just yeah. fell in line. So your first race was on a 50 there at Sykeston. So how did that transpire um, in, into your next race? You got your butt kicked. So what next? Yeah, so so we went home, and uh, it's kind of funny. I, you know, I went back to school and uh, just just doing my, doing my thing. And um, that was the only race in 99 that we raced. I don't know why. I don't know if that was the last one of the season or whatever. But uh, we went back in 2000. But I got off the school bus one day. And uh, it's kind of funny because I, I think one of you guys had brought it up in another podcast, but uh, I got off the school bus and there was this crazy looking four-wheeler, but all I knew is it looked like all the ones that had smoked my butt when I went racing. It's a L-E-M. Yeah, um, Liam. No, yeah. no. It, a Danielism, it's a Liam, but it's a Liam. for the rest yeah. of the world. Yeah. L-E-M, yeah. yeah. It's L-E-M, yeah. He can <laughs> call it whatever he wants. But. Hey, you know, hey, we got Danielisms around here. We've we've got a list of, of ease-ups and uh, – Rush Mountmore. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what else? So, I mean, we, we're, we're starting a book, okay? Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, we got this L-E-M, and that's the first year when I got smoked. They were all on stock L-E-Ms. So when we went back in 2000 – my dad, myself, I guess, you know, everybody thought that we're in the hunt yet now, you know, and uh, needless to say, we were still not in the hunt. I think I got third or fourth, but they all had hopped up go-kart tires on the rear. I mean, they still, they did their homework and they still smoked me. So what's funny is, is I think somewhere my parents have that uh that race on vhs and for, oh that's I'm awesome pretty sure, i'm pretty sure all of our listeners will understand what vhs is i have some students in youth group that are like what's a vhs <laughs> was that like a cd and i'm like kind of but no <laughs> but yeah we've got somewhere somewhere in, in the the hillian's garage is a, a vhs if you're that first race dude that's awesome love it well, hey, Rylan, uh, I know you're sharing a little bit about the e LEM, um, but you were affiliated with Extreme at one point, correct? Um, Extreme based out of Russellville here, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, kind of in between the LEM and the Extreme, um, at six years old, uh, you know, I got beat on the LEM too. So that was kind of short-lived. Uh, came home from school again, got off the bus. Uh, there's this Honda 90 uh, sitting outside. And I, I run in. I'm like, Dad, you, you got me a new four-wheeler. And he's like, uh, no. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you did, that red one out there. And uh, he said, no, that's I bought that to sell. And I'm like, well, I want it. And uh, he opened his mouth and said, uh, if you can start it, you can have it. 
So I spent the rest of the day pulling on that thing. And it may have even been the next day. I don't, I don't know. But um, he said I pulled on it and pulled on it and pulled on it. And it was hours later he said uh, he heard it start up. And he was like, oh, no. I run in there to the office and I'm like, Dad, I got it started. You got to come see. <laughs> and so kind of uh, everything, you know, started really with the Honda 90. Um, my dad tore the motor down. Uh, he put a manual clutch on it. This was back when, you know, nobody had manual clutches. He yeah. got a bunch of stuff machined and uh, we put a go go-kart axle in it. Uh, dad even ported the head and um, I think it was like a 116. And it's kind of funny, this this will lead into you, Mitch, because uh, if you remember me and you raced, uh, I was on that Honda 90 and you were on the LT80. Uh, the LT80. Yeah. So um, those, I, I want to say it was like three years there on the Honda 90 that I was extremely dominated. You know, I don't think, I really don't think I ever lost a race unless it was uh, you beat me mitch whenever we did that exped uh expedition race you know um well the, i mean and i think at that point in time we raced two different classes because the l there was kind of the lt80 class and then that four stroke class that you raced on the 90 but y'all really yeah. the first people kind of venturing out and doing that because prior to that it was like well everybody just rides the two stroke L lt80 or yeah that's what seemed to win anyway so. Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, the, I know one other time I got beat on it. Um, I crashed in the first corner and, um, I actually got back up and I was passing first going across the finish line. He just edged me out by a front front wheel, but I come all the way back through the pack, you know, and still almost won. But, um, but yeah, so, uh, So my dad, uh, oh, are you still, got, you guys yeah, still there? Yeah, we, we're good. We okay. got you. Um, Sorry, I was getting a phone call there. It's all but, good. Uh, um, so my dad become a extreme dealer okay. and, um, the owners of extreme, they're from Arkansas, they're friends of ours. And they contacted my dad and said, Hey, we want to get into racing and we want to, we want to sponsor you. And they actually offered me that same rig that, you know, later on that you, you took to the races, Mitch. Yeah. The extreme rig with the big flame. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, they offered me free bikes, pit bikes, all that stuff. Um, and so I had a, you know, factory extreme ride. And at the time, Tim Williams, which my best friend Landon, um, he he worked for us and Landon rode LT eighties and I rode the Honda 90. So dad come to me and he's like, Hey, you know, we don't know a whole lot about these the clutches and stuff in these extremes, but Tim does. What do you think about they want to give you multiple quads? What do you think about uh giving one to Landon and like we'll we'll just team up and race? And I'm like, Dad you know me, I want to beat the best. So, um, let's, let's do it. So we just teamed up. We had this factory ride. Um, and that's where my national, um, racing started was, was there with extreme. That's super cool. So a factory ride. So what were you at that time, Ryland? 12, 13? This... I think 11. Okay. 11. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. This would have been like, Oh, Four? Yes, oh four. Oh four. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Super cool. All right. Um, you know, you mentioned Landon there. Uh, I always just picture you and two, you, you, you guys as one and two, uh, because you always were competitive. You, you and Landon, no matter where we went, um, what state we were in, you and Landon were going to duke it out. If it was at Twin Creeks here, our local track, or if we went over to Elizabeth City, North Carolina, it didn't matter. Uh, it was going to be you, you and Landon. So tell us a little bit about uh, y'all's relationship. Yeah, so you know, Landon actually lived uh, about a block from me, and uh, before we even started racing, I, I've known him since. Uh, shoot, he was 
probably less than a year old. And um, we actually would run around the kitchen table racing each other on our feet, you know? So, yeah. Um, yeah so, and then Tim worked for my dad. And then uh, Landon would, every day after school, uh, Landon come over. I had a pit bike track in my front yard. And uh, we rode pit bikes. And it rain, shine, it didn't matter. We were out there. Um, we were ripping, you know. So yeah. uh, it was uh, it was a good friendship. It drove us to be, you know, the the men we are today. And um, on the landing st- subject, there, I thought of yesterday when I was driving home from the GNCC. I thought of a, f- a funny story that I felt that, like everybody would enjoy. Uh, so this was actually before the extreme days. I had a, a XR80. This thing was old and and junky as can be. And Landon had, I think it's like a a Q50. I want to say. Uh, I would have to ask ask Tim. T- Tim still owns it. It's a two stroke 50, and it's what Honda made before the XR50 or the CRF50 now. Okay. Wow. So Landon was riding that and I was riding um, my my XR80 and we're out in my front yard and I crash. And when I crash, the, the dirt bike lands on top of me. So uh, just so happens there is a doctor that went to church with us, was passing by and seen me pinned under my bike and they pull in my driveway get the motorcycle off of me and my dad comes out there cause they see, you know, there's a bunch of commotion going on in the, in the front yard. And my dad stops landing and is like, Hey, why didn't you stop and, and help Rylan out? He's underneath the dirt bike and Landon said, uh, well, you know, this, this two stroke motorcycle, if I stop, it would die and I can't get it back started. <laughs> So, hey, so for the day. <laughs> yeah. So uh we we get up and the uh the the doctor lady, she's she's like freaking out. She's like, you know, this is so dangerous and all this stuff. They get back in their car to leave, and my driveway was uh lined with cross ties. Landon smokes one of them cross ties, wipes out in the middle of the driveway, and she just like is having a fit, you know. <laughs> So yeah, that's a that's a pretty awesome story between us two. Oh, uh, that that's hilarious. I I think that pretty much uh, gives the picture of what you guys' relationship was. Mm-hmm. I thought you were gonna say that y'all had something on the line. You know, it was a ten lap race, and Landon's like, "I'm winning. Doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, if my dude's yeah. laid out, it doesn't matter. I'm not stopping because uh, <laughs> that's that's a uh, I don't know if that's friendly competition that we have talked about, but uh competition uh nonetheless you know we want we want to win so well, probably tim told him hey you can ride it but if you kill it you're done and so he's like well, like you say well i i wanted to keep riding I yeah I'm, yeah i'm not done riding, I'm not done riding. <laughs> oh man let's so go. Let, let's fast forward just a little bit uh rylan and then we'll get into we'll, we'll kind of venture outside of racing just a little bit and talk a little bit more life and kind of some things you've had to deal with there um, but Jathan Sill, I know that was another person that that really influenced you, was just a, a really good guy, a guy that had, I mean, he was superior when it came to a quad racing. Mm-hmm. So tell us a little yeah. bit about Jathan and, and your relationship with him. Yeah, so not not many people know really who Jathan is because his whole uh, racing career in, in ATVs was uh, like three years long. So we met him at Sykeston. And, uh, he was racing TT and really fast, but, uh, but a wild man, which you guys, you guys know that. Yeah. And, uh, he was having a little bit of trouble. I think he was like, uh, in his early twenties and having some trouble with his family. I mean, great, great family, not, not bad trouble. Just, just at that age where he was struggling with finding, finding himself in life and him and his dad were just you know, having a little bit of, uh, fighting back and forth. And so he asked my dad if he could come work for him. And, uh, dad was like, you know, yeah. And, um, so he comes down, he shows up and he's like, 
hey, I need a place to stay. And at the time, you know, I'm young and uh, I actually slip on the floor in, in my mom and dad's bedroom. So my right. mom. Hold on, just to interject just right there for a second. Yep. Uh, so so Ryan, he knows about that, um, sleeping in his parents' room. Yeah. We were surprised that Ryan ever moved, ever left the house, in all honesty. Okay. Yeah, I can it's remember. A big step. Yeah, it was, it was a mon <laughs> monster step. I can remember um, staying at his house. I don't know. We were probably like 17. No, I'm kidding. We were like, we were, we, we, <laughs> we were seven or eight. And, uh, you know, his dad comes in, says prayers with us. He's like, I'll see you in a minute, dad. I'm just puzzled. Just laying there. I'm going, I sleep like hours. I don't sleep minutes, you know. You know, I'm a practical person when it comes to math. Um, yeah. And, uh, I was just curious. So I rolled over and closed my eyes and I said, bitch, get your stuff. Come on. So we go in there and he crawls in bed with his parents and I make a pallet. And I think that was a left him hanging. <laughs> left him on a pallet. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's so, awesome. See you. So uh, I guess you two guys can relate with with uh, just being attached to your parents. And now being a parent myself, I can definitely understand. I have one that's in the bed with me every night. So, you know, yeah, you two guys. Yeah, so, OK, <laughs> so my mom, um, my my mom offered up my room to Jathan and he moved in with us and, you know, worked for my for my dad. And it was like having a big brother that I that I never had. And um, man, he's a he's a wild man, like as good as gold, but, uh, I can remember he'd come jerk me out of the shower and I'm like, you know, at that age, I, I didn't know what to think. Like he would, he would drag me out of the shower. Hey, let's go. We're going to work, you know? And, uh, and so he, you know, at that time he's, he's becoming really, really fast. He's racing, um, TT, and, uh, you know, I'm looking up to him as a racer, as a big brother, um, you know, as a, as a friend, uh, just, just everything really. And, uh, a, a pamphlet shows up in the mail from Riverfront Grand Prix, which is a local cross country race. Uh, Daniel, you know, yep, plenty Saturday. about that. Saturday after Thanksgiving, it's every year, Saturday after Thanksgiving. Yeah, so uh, that shows up, and my dad slid it over and said, hey, Jathan, you want to you wanna go race that? And um, he said, well, my 250R, uh, you know, can I ride it? And because he, he had a motocross bike, he, he would practice on motocross and stuff, and um, dad's like, ah, I don't know. That might be a little bit wide, but if you want to race, um, I've got a 400 EX you can, you can race. And so, um, Jathan's like, well, yeah, let's go. And by the time the race got there, my dad, he decided to race too. So I was the pit crew and, uh, that's really where my cross country, um, background started. Jathan w went to that. Uh, he had never raced cross country, didn't know what he was up, up against. I think the 400 EX had a steering dampener, maybe a pipe tires. And I don't know, he was lucky if he, if he had an aftermarket set of handlebars on that thing, you know, <laughs> and, uh, ended up winning the overall on it. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, um, and, and the guy was just an animal. And then, uh, you know, he went on to, um, his third ever GNCC, uh, it was when the 450R had just come out. Uh, he didn't, he, I think he got tires on it and that was it. And, uh, he finished 12th overall. That is, uh, you know, the first, first ever, uh, GNCC. And then I want to say two weeks later in Florida, he, he finished eighth overall. Uh, he had a pipe on it by then. Um, <laughs> Took but the, spot, right? the guy... The guy was just an absolute animal. That year, he ended up um, finishing uh, 12th overall for the year in GNCC and third in Pro-Am. And I want to say that uh, he had to miss two races to go race the TT Nationals. And he finished uh, third in the Pro Class in the TT Nationals behind. I don't, I'm not for sure if 
if Keith Little and Keith, Tim Farr. Keith Little, yeah, yeah, Keith Little won and Tim got second, or yeah. or Tim Farr won and Keith got second. But but yeah, Jason finished third third that year behind them. From top of the line athletes to weekend warriors, 110% nutrition has the supplements, the knowledge you need to take your fitness to the next level. They are now the title sponsor of the NEEDT series for the 23 season and work with some of the top pros in the sport like Aaron Medlin, Brad Riley, and amateur rider of the year, Tanner Terry. Check them out on the web today. Make sure to use our code REMAIN at checkout for a discount. Work with the guys that support the sport that we all love. 110% nutrition. Oh, dude, J Jathan was an animal. He just, he still owes me a bike, by the way. I was 15 trying to move up and we didn't have any money. And one of his pro level quads was sitting right there in y'all shop on the showroom. And I called Jathan. I said, Jathan, man, I need a bike. And he's like, ah, oh, boy, you don't need that bike. I'll get you one. I'll build you. Daniel, I promise, I'll build you a bike one day. Just wait. And here we are, 25 <laughs> years later, still don't have a four wheeler. So, you know? well, you know. You need to get with him on that. I so know. team team three sixteen might bring out a a quad for the builders brawl. Is that what you're saying? Hey, that's uh, that's gonna happen. I I really can't talk much about that. Oh, but, oh uh, well, hey, we were we were just wondering. Yeah. Uh, I I wanted to throw the three sixteen in there because I remember Jathan always ran the three sixteen. I'm repping uh, it tonight. I even got my team three sixteen shirt on. That's right, John three sixteen and Ryland. You kind of picked it up from that point, and uh, you know I could tell that. I mean, Jathan impacted all of us because it was a guy who just came hot on the scene and just immediately ascended. But just as quick as he ascended, then then you know he's kind of gone. And you know, Jathan's Jathan's racing was over, but you you have stuck through and continued on with racing basically your 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 entire life. And I want to get a little bit deeper into that story um, of racing as as we go. But right now, I want to talk about so as you kind of got into your teen years and got into high school, um, you had a little bit of trouble um, at that point in time and, and trying to race and balance that. Um, so tell us a little bit about what happened there in the, those high school days. Yeah, so I, I want to touch on that 316. I'm glad you brought that up because I didn't even put that in my notes. But yeah, actually, Jathan, uh, I was running number two, and that was because – uh, Shane Hitt was number two, and that's that that was the man. That's who that's who I looked up to. And Jathan um, came in the shop one day, and he's like, "Hey," and I don't even remember what number he was running, maybe thirty three or something like that. But he came in the shop, and he said, uh, "I'm thinking about switching my number to three sixteen for John three sixteen. And I overheard him say that, and I was like, "Why didn't I ever think of that?" It, so he, he went back, he switched his number and so did I. And, uh, it really, I would like to say it was because of Jathan, but it wasn't, it was for my Lord and savior, you know, and, uh, I like I, that stuck with me ever since. Love it. Love the 316 number. Yeah. And I can remember, you know, cause Jathan was, he was jacked. Like he was, he was stout. And so I remember the first time meeting him, you know, they pull up and, they kind of park off by themselves and they roll out this 250R and it's got 316 on it. And you look at Jason and you think, I think he could kill me with his bare hands. Like he's <laughs> nicest guy in the world, but dude, he, you don't tangle with Jathan. He, he put my face in the dirt. I was picking on him one time and well, I've never done it again, <laughs> but you look, oh, yeah. you, you look and you think in 316, what is this like, the wrestler or the sorry as we say in Arkansas, the wrestler 316. Yeah. And he's like, no man, it's John 316. It's like, oh cool. So you love Jesus. Yeah, man, I love Jesus. You know, so <laughs> man, yeah. it, it's just cool that that he started out like I'm wearing my t-shirt right now, but team 316 it says racing for Christ racing in Christ, racing for Christ. And then uh, you know, that was kind of on the TT scene a little bit. Well then it went into the woods and uh, our good friend Bud Friedrich he kind of kept it going through cross country. And that's what here, when we stepped back, you know, last summer, I was like, we got to get some new team 316 shirts, you know? So it's, and it's it made cool. for a good conversation piece at Pine Lake too. Oh yeah. After EDT church. Mm -hmm. um, 
So people had some questions about, uh, I guess I had the team 316 mm-hmm. shirt. I think both of us did actually. And uh, then after, so they were wanting to know kind of the backstory behind that. Did you, did you guys start this? We're like, no, you know, I mean, we love Jesus. So we're just continuing it. Yeah. Um, we didn't start. Yeah. So, you know. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Jathan, still to this day, I give him so much credit um, because, you know, he, he really uh, helped me get to where I'm at with, was set up for cross country and, uh, you know, just making me think outside the box. And, and like Daniel said, um, he was a professional water skier before he started racing four wheelers. And, uh, he was, uh, looked like he should have been a wrestler. Yeah. And, and I, I think he's probably the most talent I've worked with a lot of racers, a lot of professional racers. Uh, and I think Jathan's got them beat on talent. And he definitely had him beat on work ethic. That dude was insane. Uh, I wish I had half of what he had, you know? Yeah, my parents, they shipped me down there uh, right before I went into the amateur ranks. Dad said, uh, we're going to drop you off at Jathan's, which this is the second time I've been dropped off. The first time was in Texas to actually grow some, if you know what I mean. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and jump jump stuff and, and actually get out of my shell, I guess. But uh, so the second time was Jathan's house. And, uh, you know, mom and dad dropped me off. They said, you're going to spend a week with Jathan and you're going to figure out what it's like to be a racer. And uh, I did. Um, I pound the ground a lot trying to jump the trees. Um, But, uh, man, it it was there was no doubt that Jathan, from the moment we woke up, it was business. We had a good time. But he's like, you know, we're going to swim across this. If you drown, um, we'll we'll. We'll pump the water out of you and we're going to swim it again. Top dip. Yeah, that's, a, that know, that's, like a, yeah, yeah, that's pretty much what I can remember as <clears throat> as a young teen. Uh, but but anyway, it was it was super cool to get to spend some time with him and figure out the determination and drive that it takes to, you know, succeed at anything, really. But yeah. but especially at racing, um, just the determination and mindset. Um, so that was super fun experience for me. Yeah. So I'll get back to where we were on the, on the, uh, you know, with the school and stuff. So, um, after the extreme, uh, I I feel like I need to put this in there. We, we moved up to the 90 mod, which Mitch, you're very familiar with the 90 mod as well. Um, I went, uh, my biggest competition was the guy I'm sure you guys know, Joel Hittrick. Yeah. Uh, so Joel and then Matthew Carter, which is, another guy you you guys know absolutely um so uh i i raced uh the 90 mod i think it was i think it was two years there and uh and did really well and battled with those guys but man it's um you know i, I beat joel a lot and he beat me a lot uh but i was a tt only guy and matthew and joel both uh, race motocross as well. And it seemed like, uh, I had their number in the heat races, but when it came to that long main event and the track got a little bit rough, um, they would put it to me, you know, they were just, they'd outlast me. And, um, so, uh, a little later in my career, we'll see that, uh, I worked on that part too, to, to figure out how to get, you know, in better shape. Yeah. Um, but I moved up, uh, after those two years, I moved up um, to a 300 EX and, um, in the youth production class, which was like the pro of youth. Yeah. 12, and, 15, so, so yeah. in that rate age range. Yeah. Yeah. So my whole, uh, other than my extreme year, uh, after the extreme year, I was always the youngest of the class. So yeah. if the class was 13 to 16, like that youth production, okay. I moved in into it at 13. Yeah. Um, and then I was racing, you know, it seemed like it was always, I was up against, uh, the older kids. And, uh, so my first year on the 300, uh, white Gann, um, was in that class. He's really fast. Uh, they owned a, a TT track as well in Ava, Missouri. Yeah. And, uh, that was my biggest competition. And, and, uh, I think for the year, uh, I think I finished third that year in the championship. Uh, you know, won a lot. And then, um, I, uh, I was on a mission, you know, I was always the youngest and it seemed like I was, I was outgunned. And, uh, 
So we come back the following year, which would have been 2008. And um, I set a goal that I was going to pull every whole shot and win every main event. <laughs> um, and and I did just that until we got to the the last race and I had never been put in that position. Um, you know, the pressure was on my shoulders and uh, I come off the line, the last main event. Um, I had to, I had to finish at least fourth to, to win the championship. And, uh, I was second into the first corner. I was like, oh, this ain't, you know, too bad, but it ain't the whole shot. Like I was already kind of beat down, you know? And, uh, I think on lap three, it was, I went into the sweeper and bent my shifter underneath the case on that 300 EX. And so I had to get off the bike and y'all, you guys know in TT, you don't get off the bike no, and pull my shifter back out and take back off. And luckily I only lost two positions. So, uh, I was in fourth, I was right where I needed to be. And I, and I brought that, that championship home. Um, but this story of, of my schooling goes right along with this championship that I'm, that I'm fighting for here. I, uh, I was in the ninth grade and my school would only let me miss nine days of school. I'm not a sickly person. I don't miss school. I, I didn't like school, but I didn't miss it unless I was going racing and, uh, racing TT, you guys know, uh, you practice on Friday and you, you race on Saturday. So, you know, some of the races we would have to leave Wednesday night to make it to it. And, uh, my school called and they had told me that I had missed eight days. This was right before that last race there. Um, and that if I missed another day, they were going to drop my credit. So I was going to have to do ninth grade over again. And, uh, my parents, they went up to the school, they talked to the superintendent, they talked to everybody that they could. And, uh, it was just a dead end everywhere they went. They, everyone was telling them just, we're going to, we're going to drop his credit. He's going to have to do ninth grade over again. And, uh, you know, I'm winning a national championship at the time. I, I've got this one race left. Um, and my parents were, we were committed. So, um, they decided to let me quit school. And, um, I don't promote that. I wish that I could have finished school. Um, I hope that my story, uh, reaches people and, and, you know, schools will work with athletes a little bit more because I'm living proof that it does go somewhere. And, um, so, so we ended up, we quit school, they were, they were going to homeschool me, but both my parents are self-employed. So that ended up me homeschooling myself. And, uh, you know, you guys can, <laughs> can see the rest of the story there. <laughs> Let's just say the, the front yeah. yard ruts got a little deeper. Yeah. Yes. Yes, they did. <laughs> they did. Yeah. That, so, you know, that, is, that is one thing now, you know, they've got like the on track learning deal and there's, you know, if that situation ever does come up, you know, for, for kids that are racing at all different types of levels, they can basically learn in the motor home or in the, or whatever, you know, so that is another option, but yeah, we're here at Remainder, we're not advocating for students to drop out of school. You know, it's just, you're just telling your story, Rylan. We got, yeah, yeah. Not, yeah that's, <laughs> uh, I mean, I've got kids and, uh, they're going to finish school. You know, I, I don't, uh, uh, I don't tell anybody it's okay. And, and later in my story, I'll, I'll tell a little bit about how, you know, that in impacted my life. Um, I went through some rough times, but, um, it, it, it all worked out. So. Well, let's just, let's keep rolling with that. Uh, kind of that theme there, Rylan, uh, how did God lead you through those rough times, which ultimately led to what we know today is RJR. Yeah. So, um, I, uh, I was 19. Um, this was kind of, uh, the year I won my, my championship there on the, in the youth production class, uh, I would have had to race that class over again. I won it at 14. You can't move up to a 450 until you're 16. So, um, we actually decided to go, I had been racing some local cross country. Um, and we decided to go racing cross country at full, you know, full time. 
and uh, I was going to do the GNCCs the next year. Uh, we kind of had this rivalry, uh, me and Walker Fowler, because I was dominating the TT side of things. He was dominating the cross country side of things. And Mitch, you'll probably know a, a name, Neil McGrath, yeah. was dominating the the motocross side of things. Yeah. And so we kind of all had this a little bit of rivalry, and I was the one that was brave enough to jump out of my sport and jump in another sport. And so we went uh, racing cross country full time, and um, that was a that was a big jump. We we built a quad. Um, at the time, you could modify the chassis on a 300EX, so I was going to race the same youth production class just in, in GNCC. And that off-season, they changed the rules where you could not modify the chassis, and we had already done all that. So uh, we we kind of backed out on that deal and just, just went racing locals instead of the, the GNCC stuff. Um, so... Uh, I, you know, I raced, raced cross country for a few years there. Uh, I, I finally did, uh, I went to college a first, uh, in GNCC on a 450. Um, you know, everything's just kind of, kind of moving along, uh, doing, doing pretty good, you know? Um, and then, uh, went, went to pro-am, uh, XC2 and, um, I'm, I'm 19 years old. I'm, I'm really uh, I'm as fast as I, I probably ever was or, cl- you know, close to it. Um, a good, you know, podium contender in XC2. And uh, I, I thought I knew it all. And my parents and I, we got into it one day here at the shop. And they told me to leave. And so I went, I packed up my clothes. I um, put one of my quads in the back of the truck. And I left and uh, I got about an hour from here and I was thinking, what am I going to do? Like, I, I don't, I mean, I got good friends. That's all, that's all I knew. So I called one of my best friends, Caleb Dykus. I called his dad and I said, Hey, Timmy, he's like a second dad to me. And I'm like, Timmy, uh, I need a place to live. And uh, I said, I'll work, do whatever I need to do. Luckily, he's self-employed, and he's like, Rylan, you know you've got a home here anytime. He said, but if you come down here, you and my boy have to go get your GED. I'm like, Timmy, I was done with school a long time ago, but if that's what it takes, that's what I'll do. So uh, I move in with them. I start working working for him. Uh, Caleb and I, we went and got our GEDs together. And, um, man, it's probably the, the greatest thing that's ever happened to me, um, you know, as a, as a man, um, growing up spiritually, you know, everything was, um, just, just getting out there, you know, on my own, my parents and I, we, we made amends. I was there for about three months and just everything was, was flowing and finally one day, uh, Timmy, they come to me and they said, you know, we, we feel like our works here, here is done and, um, it's time for you to, to move on. And at the time I thought, well, this just started, you know, uh, and I just got to a point in my life where I felt like I fit and, uh, needless to say, you know, God had something in, in store for me and, uh, my parents and I, like I said, it was on a, a good relationship at that point. So I come back home and, uh, it wasn't just a couple months later. Uh, I was working with dirt, dirt works, motorsports, um, as my suspension people at the time. And Randy, the dad, he's getting older and he's gusset in frames and he's like, you know, I'm going to have to give this this frame stuff up and I'm like, what, you know, what, why, why would you do that? And he's like the grind and dust and stuff's getting to me and I'm going to have to get it up, give it up. And, uh, we, you know, we've got a guy in mind and I said, well, I, I want to do it. And he said, well, you know, he said the way we see it, we've, we've got a guy in mind, but, um, 
you're you're more than welcome to do it too uh i we really want to see this product go on and um if we give you know two people an opportunity somebody will run with it and uh so i had three hundred dollars to my name at the time and my dad he was like you know i'll uh, I've got a couple credit cards. I'll let you put some stuff on a credit cards and we'll get this thing rolling. Uh, but it's, it's your baby. You got to pay the bills. So I'd never picked up a TIG welder in my life. Uh, my dad taught me to MIG weld when I was, uh, six and, um, I'll send you guys some pictures. I'll have to dig them out, but I've got the first ever pit bike stand that I built. And then I've got one that I built a week later. And the first one looks absolutely terrible. And the one a week later, uh, it, it actually looks really good. It's a big difference between the two. So <laughs> I'll send you guys that so y'all can, you know, post it up. But, um, but yeah, so I, I bought a TIG welder. I bought a MIG welder um, and a bunch of stuff that I needed to, to start this, you know, frame gusseting business at the time. That's, that's all he was given away you know and i ran with it i i was building stuff and as a racer you know it was uh there was this stuff that i, I could never get nerf bars to hold up so i went to hill guards because that's the only thing i could get hold, to hold up you know and um i was never happy with a hill guard and peg set up so i started building hill guards and pegs and then i was like well i got this equipment i better build a bumper and I built a bumper, built a grab bar, and and it just went rolling from there. You know, with you know every path, you know whatever you decide to do in life, you get tested. You know, and you're thinking, man, I'm I'm moving up in XC two. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna get one of these championships. I'm gonna move up. Me and Walker Fowler can go. You know, get after it again. Like we, you know, got little rivalry you were talking about, and then all these, you know, kind of things start to change direction, but. Tell us how God used those times to find a, a new relationship with Christ. Where where does where does that story kind of pick back up? Yeah, so I think I think through all that, you know, uh, God broke me down, and then um, He blessed me, blessed me with this business, and um, you know, I, I was in church the entire time, um, but uh, through that blessing, like I, I found. I found a, a life that I really didn't know. And, and we actually started going to a new church at the, at the time. And, um, their, their big thing was, uh, we're all messed up people and we serve the perfect savior. And that really spoke to me. And I, I realized that, you know, I am a sinner and, and I've got a perfect savior and I started living life different. Um, you know, I, I kind of raised in church. I always thought we were supposed to be this, you know, perfect person. We're supposed to just live this perfect life. And whenever I really come to grasp that we are broken people and, you know, not that I go out and, and look for wrongdoing because I don't, but I, I live life and I look to the one above as my savior. And, and, you know, that's the one that's going to save me. That's the one that that's forgives me. And uh, that's the one that I'm going to be with one day. You know, and that's, you know, as you, as you're kind of going through this time, you know, you're taking that relationship, you know, that that's one thing I try to tell my students. I mean, that's what we're about remaining in the race, remaining in that race, you know, and, and keeping Christ a priority. So you're growing, your business is taking off. I mean, I, I remember, you know, watching kind of this thing progress, you know, cause uh, dirt works, they built great stuff in the XC world. And then it's like, now there's not as much XC stuff. And then, you know, you're taking it over. And so something happens though, Ryland, because, uh, you know, we've been buddies for a long time. We always just shoot straight and Ryland, you've always worked hard, but you always had more than enough time to go ride or do whatever you needed to. Well, now you, you got to pay the bills. We got to pay the credit card off and yada, yada. So your role in the GNCC world shifted from a, you know, a top tier racer to 
kind of this mentor position and kind of sponsoring guys and helping helping them grow. So what has that transition been like for you? You know, to move from the like the the racer into the the builder sponsor guy. Yeah, for sure. So um you know I, I tried for a few years there, I tried to do it both, you know, do do both of them. And uh I was, you know, a a podium contender in XC two at the time and and uh you guys know that you can't you can't just show up and race at that level. Um so I was trying to practice, work on my quads, keep all this stuff together and um and, and run this business too. And you know, I I got to the point where I wouldn't even start working on my quad until Thursday and we would have to leave Friday morning to make it to these GNCCs, you know, and dad would always come to me and he, he wouldn't like overly, uh, you know, get on to me about it. But he's like, you know, I know you're busy, but we're going to these races and, and I'm worried about you. You're staying up all night and trying to get your quad ready. And he's like, I, I know you do things top notch, you're a perfectionist, but it's hard to pack all that in in eight to 10 hours and get this quad ready. And if you don't have parts, what are you going to do? You know, and I'm like, you know, dad, I, I don't know, but this is what I love. And my, my goal was always to be number one in the country. So, um, you know, at the time I'm working with Adam McGill running my parts, Braden Henthorn, his brother-in-law, um, you know, he was running my parts, uh, Bryce and Neil, um, you know, there was, there was a, there was a bunch of them at one time. I had eight of the top 20 GNCC pros, uh, running my parts. And I finally, you know, I, I realized that like, I enjoy working with people. I enjoy talking to these people and, and luckily in my role, um, you know, my dad always raised me where when we would head home from the races, he would be asking me questions about the about the bike. What could you do different? How could you change this? How could you do that? And it made me be a thinker. Yeah. It made me think about suspension and think about, you know, NTT grooving tires and moving your sway bar and, and you know, all these things that uh, make you go fast. Yeah. And being a TT background, I, t I just took all that stuff to cross country. Mm -hmm. And, um, so with working with these pros, I just started kind of feeding into their program, looking at what I could do to help and, and understanding, you know, what Chris Borch's program, how it runs and how Adam McGill's runs and how Walker Fowler's runs. And, and luckily in my position, I'm friends with all them guys. So I get the nitty gritty details and, you know, I, I pay attention. Uh, I, I do like to talk, but my ears are bigger than my mouth. And so I listen to every <laughs> little detail and it's probably a dangerous thing. These people don't probably don't realize, but I take everything to heart and I study racing. I, and it's a seven day, seven day a week deal for me, you know, and I found the joy in, uh, you know, just being that, that side of it, just, you know, hanging out and, and, uh, training people. And, and that's kind of what I do today is, you know, I have this business, uh, I build quads, but, um, I like to help people, you know, uh, Mitch, when, when he got back started, I helped him in the TT world on setup and, um, just trying to be that guy off the track that, looks into the program and says, Hey, what do you think about this? Rylan, I man, I'm super impressed by that too, because, you know, I knew you had a stellar business. Um, you know, your dad was always a stand up guy. And, I mean, you, you come from a great family. Um, but man, it's, it really impressed me as I got back in the TT world, you know, you and I kind of grew up around each other. You were younger than I was. Um, but just to see you like step into my program in TT and uh, just really turn it around. You know, I'm, I'm over here scrambling, trying to figure out, you know, trying to chase my tail or <laughs> figure out what in the world I'm doing. And then you show up and you're like, Hey, let's do this. And it's like, Holy crap. 
that's nice. And then you do this. Oh, that's even nicer. And then you just keep going. I'm like, all right, Rylan, you just take this thing and run with it. Um, uh, as, as far as setup philosophies go, you, you just really kind of turned it around there for me. And, uh, you're always scratching and clawing for more. Like you're never, you're never satisfied. You want more. I mean, I can recall, um, I, I get a little more worked up than you do, I think, as far as nervousness and things like that. Rylan, you know, I'm like, man, I'm just going to turn it over to you. You set it up. You do whatever. I'll just ride the thing. And uh, you are making changes. And I'm like, hey, I'm supposed to be lined up in staging. Like, it's time to race. I think you'll have the, the rear end, like, basically torn out from my machine. Uh, I won't share exactly what that setup change was. Uh, okay. But you, you were, I mean, you can share that if you want. But, I mean, you were searching for, like, a sixteenth of an inch is what you were doing but you wanted that much more. And uh, I'm like, man, I got a race. So, you know, it's pretty much like they're calling two minutes and, and you're just, Oh, we're good. We're good. We'll get this thing slammed together. And and then I pull up. <laughs> hey man, don't worry about it. It'd be just fine. It's, they're on the line. We got to oh, yeah. worry about it. All right. But anyway, I mean, that was an awesome experience because we went from really struggling that weekend to just racing right at the top because of all the things that you did. 88 Live to Ride is a nonprofit foundation invested in the protection, education, and safety advancements for all riders involved in ATV racing. One way you can support Miss Debbie Pard Tosic over there is to log into smile.amazon.com when you're making all your purchases there and select 88 Live to Ride as the nonprofit you would like to donate to. Again, that's smile.amazon.com in 88 live to ride. But, you know, aside from your setup stuff, I will say, um, you know, you said struggle to find Nerf bars that um, that would work for you. I have brick, broken my fair share of Nerf bars. I mean, I've broken everything there is to break on a quad with all the hours I've spent on one. But, dude, I was just telling someone the other day, those – and I know you don't necessarily sell in these, but those Nerf bars yeah. that you made me with those pegs, um, there's nothing that can even touch those. Um, I think I could just go, I mean, like as far as comfort and the way they feel and the durability, um, you know, I want you to make Nerf bars because those things are the baddest things that I ever have ever ridden. I won't, I won't put anything else under, under myself anymore. Yeah. Well, uh, I definitely appreciate that, you know, can you still hear me fine? One of yeah. my earphones went dead here. So, um, yeah, I appreciate that. You know, uh, we we definitely uh, want to get that in the Nerf Bar world there. You know, um, it's it's tough because uh, it's just me and my wife here uh, working in the shop, and you know, I've tried to try to get employees, but it's 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 tough. And uh, I'm a perfectionist, so I like everything to be perfect and um, you know, I feel like that God blessed me with, I call it eyesight because I can see something and bring it to life. It doesn't matter what it, what it is. I feel like, you know, that I, I can see it and, uh, make it better. And, and I, somehow I can improve, approve upon what I build myself. Yeah. So, um, that's probably dangerous for other people because, uh, you know, we're in the world of business here and I can always, I feel like I can always improve upon, you know, what I do, but, um, that, well, that's my goal. Rylan, ultimately, I think that's what separates, um, good from great or great from elite, um, or people that are, that have that kind of mindset, you know, kind of yeah. mindset of, um, you know, I mean, you can, we're, we're told in the word to be content, um, with, with the things that we have. But using that inward drive that that Christ has put in us to to perform at the highest level that we possibly can is what is what separates those that make it and those that don't make it for sure. Yeah. And it also says, you know, run the race to win, be content, but you better be putting in the work. Yeah. Put in the work. Yeah. And that's what I do. I mean, in business, I've always told myself, if I can't build it better than the next guy, then I just don't even build it. I'm not here to copy anybody. Yeah. I'm not here to to do something like someone else does it. Uh, I build what I build, and I build it to the best of my ability, and, um, you know, that's what I do. Absolutely. 
Hey, Rylan, let's, uh, hey, how about we talk about uh, family life now, man? How, how's everything going right now? You know, what you got going on with family stuff? Yeah, yeah, so I, I kind of want to take it back a little bit because um, I went I went through something else and, um, you know, I, I know, Ryan, uh, I know you've kind of been through a similar situation, so it's something that I felt like was was led on my heart, you know. Um, I, you know, everything was going, was going really good. It's at the same time where I'm making the transition from, from racing, you know, trying to be a full-time racer and, and full-time business guy. And, um, you know, at the top of my game in both. And, uh, I, I found, found this, this girl and I thought that she was the perfect one. And, um, I got married and needless to say, uh, three months later, um, she left. Uh, I found out that she was having an affair and, um, man, it, it broke me. Um, it was, uh, it was the worst thing that ever happened to me. Um, I had never failed at anything in life before anything I set my mind to, I won at. And, um, I ended up getting a divorce being raised in church. I, I don't, I didn't believe in divorce. Um, so, uh, and then to add to this, I'm working with Devin Feehan, a GNCC pro at the time. Uh, we built this new lowered PRX Honda for him to race, uh, which Mitch you're familiar with in motocross. That's a pretty common thing in cross country. No one had done it. So we did it. And, um, we were testing in North Carolina and I was riding myself. We were on a motocross track, uh, second lap. I come around. I thought this was a double. I jumped it. It was a triple. I cased into the third one and broke my wrist. So this is all like at the same time when, when she leaves and I've got a broke wrist and I've got to, I've got to go home and work. Um, so I, uh, I, I fight through this, you know, and, um, I really put my trust in God. I started digging in the word, um, you know, didn't really understand what's going on. And, uh, you know, I, I pull through it and, um, you know, I felt like that God really worked in me and he, uh, I've always been a very, very confident guy. Like, I uh, I don't feel like I'm cocky by no means, but I'm very confident and I feel like that God, um, you know, humbled me through all that and, uh, made me be, uh, the person that I needed to be, to be a good dad, a good father, um, a good son, you know, uh, a good friend and things that I never thought about before, you know, I, I started to think about, and I feel like that God revealed all that. And uh, even though still to this day, like, I don't understand why I had to go through divorce, but maybe I'm bullheaded enough that God was like, we got to make it real for you, you know? And um, so I, so I get through all that and uh, I really find my way back in life and, and I'm just cruising along and I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm happy. I'm content. I found happiness in myself. And then all of a sudden one day I get this girl follows me on Instagram and I'm like, man, this, this girl is, she's pretty. Like, <laughs> why is she following me? You know? Yeah. If you could see. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so a bit. I'm like, I, I, I had to go to Facebook. I'm like, you know, who, who is this? So I went to Facebook, I added her on Facebook and, and just so happens, I mean, you guys know I'm, I'm from the Searcy Judsonia area, which is about two hours from where I live now. And she's from the same area. And I'm like, you know, how, how does she know me? Right. And yeah. so it's finally, not, I'm, I'm for those listening. It's, it's not that, I mean, it's a good sized town, but it's not like a metropolitan area. I mean, it's no. a, it's a small town with a courthouse. That's about it, you know? No, and and I don't, you know, I'm like, this is this is weird. So I messaged her. I'm like, do I do I know you or something? She's like, no. 
but she's like, I know of your sister and I seen where, uh, you were wake surfing and your sister jumped on the, the board with you and y'all went under the water. I thought it was funny. And she's like, so I just thought I would follow you on Instagram. Well, it, you know, that, that now didn't know it at the time, but that's, that's now my wife. And, you know, God sent this, sent this woman, beautiful woman in my life. And, um, you know, she's absolutely amazing. Uh, she, she had a daughter and uh, I was able to adopt her daughter, which uh, I don't even see it that way. She's my daughter, you know, and uh, um, and then so we she's a Christian girl. We go to you know, we go to church every Sunday. Uh, we love life. She helps me in in the business. She works here for me. And um, we have a, we have a beautiful son now, you know, and uh, it's it's amazing, you know. Yeah, every uh, if you get a package that's from RJR, Rylan may have like built it, but the the handling, the care, the tape, the phone calls, the emails, that's all Jamie. <laughs> she, yep. is, she is doing it all, man. She's she's a an, an awesome young lady, and y'all do have a an, a beautiful family there too. So, man, it's man, it's crazy, crazy story and of how God's continuing to work through you. I mean, it ain't over. We're, we still going. Yeah. We still yeah, going. for sure. It is. It is. I want to go back to uh, one point you made <clears throat> that I can, I can relate to, uh, you know, when, when something like that, when you go through something like that, th there's, there's really two responses. You can either, you know, you can turn away from everything you've been raised in faith and, that's kind of where I found myself. You know, I, I was like, when I went through a similar, you know, uh, situation, I was like, you know, I, I could either turn on, you know, being confused and trying to figure out which route do I go. I, I did the same thing. I'm so thankful that I had enough roots to know, you know, that I could fully trust in God and, you know, everything uh, and it's so to hear that, you know, from you, I didn't know all that necessarily. And uh, so to hear you share that, that, that that's awesome. So. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So it's it's uh, it's definitely, you know, a, a crazy thing. I uh, like I said before, when I was young, I, I didn't think I had a testimony, you know, I've just been in, I've been in church my entire life, saved as a, a little boy and. Um, you know, that's why one thing I, I really, um, you know, why I felt like it was led, led on my heart to, to come on this deal is, is to get, get real. And, uh, unfortunately, you know, we, we went through similar situations there. Um, but you know, Ryan, I always kind of, kind of looked up to you, you know, I, I have told Mitch and Daniel this, I think, but, uh, during my extreme days, you know, they gave me pit bikes too. And. Uh, I always had a chance to beat you because I knew I knew you were going to crash. You know, you were extremely fast, but you were going to crash. It was inevitable. Yeah, yeah. So when we raced pit bikes, dude, it was like you you were. I was gunning for you. <laughs> That's so funny dude. because I can remember, and even now, like um, anytime Ryan, if, if you have to miss a podcast, Ryan's like, "Hey, I listened, but this one was terrible. There wasn't Ryan. There was no Ryan." Yeah. Oh man, uh, that's funny. Well, that's the good thing, Rylan. You got to know your competition, even if it's just beating one of them. But you knew you could do it. You were you were in his head. That's what it was. Yeah, I, I'm I'm pretty smart when it comes to that kind of stuff. I know all three of you got you guys real well. So your strengths, your weaknesses, all of it. <laughs> Wait, I have a weakness. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm kidding. Oh, yeah. I, I know. I know. I know my weakness. <laughs> Rylan says. Mitch, stay off the motocross track. Yep. You're going to get yourself hurt. Yeah. Yeah, you and Jathan got that in common. Y'all are fast. I, you're going to get yourself hurt. I, yeah, well, I mean, because we don't we don't have the smooth finesse, okay? Our speed yeah. comes by being out of control, you know? It's just like it either sticks or it doesn't. Yeah. But, hey, um, I probably shouldn't have gone motocross, but it led me where I'm at today, you know? I mean, similar circumstance, sure. and uh, I will share <laughs> That's crazy. Think about that. So I guess we're coming up May. It'll be two years, right? Two, two years. years. Yeah. 
And so, you know, I'm on the outside looking in, you know, and we'd pass each other in a restaurant or whatever. And, you know, dad still raced a little bit. So dad and Mark talked every week, I think, since 2000, you know. So I'm kind of keeping up with Rylan, kind of keeping up with Mitch. Well, then you're doing Moto Church and then you get hurt. And you're like, how do we keep doing Moto Church? If we can't go. There? And that leads to the podcast. That leads to me racing again. That leads to all of us doing. I mean, it is just. It is just crazy. You know, there's so many times in life, guys, that you you go through something and, and all of us have a story. OK, and you're going, God, what in the world are you doing, man? Like, I yeah. trust you. But are, are you did you take a vacation? Did you forget to tell me like what's going on? But here you can look back on your life and go, God knew exactly what he was doing. You know, I was the idiot. He, he was trying to test my faith a little bit, you know, and that's. We could preach a sermon on that, but it is so cool that because you jump back into racing and Rylan, you're doing your thing and and everything with Ryan's life and my life. And but here we are just talking about how good God is. I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, it just blows my mind over and over and over. And it's awesome, man. Yeah. It's so it, awesome. It's really, I mean, it's, it's crazy as we see it, mm-hmm. uh, sit back and watch it unfold, but truly it's all a blessing. Um, the, us four guys just sitting here talking and about how our life has been intertwined, but how we're closer now and how God has worked through, through each one of us. I mean, you know, just the, the moment you and Ryan just had, you know, it's like, I was over here just trying to gather myself a little bit, um, you know, trying to lighten it up a little bit because I didn't want to get too emotional. Uh, but uh, it is super cool. Um, when we get to step back and see the blessing and how God works. <laughs> every trial is, is different and it's to a different magnitude. I mean, I can't necessarily relate to exactly what you and Ryan have gone through, but um, God has a purpose in, in each one of it. He's each, each thing. He says that he works all things to good for those called according to his purpose. You know, Paul wrote that and Paul was end up being martyred. Well, that wouldn't, we wouldn't consider that good, but Paul impacted us, didn't he? And he can continues to impact millions and millions and millions of people. So we never know what his plan is in in it other than we just return to him for our strength. When we're at that crossroad in life, it's the choice of I can try to take this in my own hands because I'm used to accomplishing things and I can do whatever I set my mind to, um, which at some point in life, you know, we've heard of a couple of your your situations, Rylan, that and all of us can attest to that um, in our in our lives as well, where if we take it in our own hands there's going to be something that goes awry somewhere. There might be some successes, but something will go awry. But if we turn and put it in God's hand, the the it's just a greater magnitude. It impacts more people than just us. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll quit preaching a little bit and let, let Ryan oh, take it back over. But you're on point. That is, I mean, that is what I enjoy about seeing stuff like this unfold. And that's what I want this podcast to do, um, I mean, that is our whole thing here. We want to impact people for Christ and show them that, you know, it isn't just a salvation experience. We want you to come to salvation, Mm -hmm. but it's more, the Christian walk is more than that. It's remaining in the race. It's remaining in that walk and continuing to let God lead you and direct you in whatever path that he has designed because you don't know the impact that it's going to have on other people. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> well, so, I mean, so where, you know, what's, what's Rylan got? I mean, what, what about today? You know, where are you at today and, and everything, what all's business and family and juggling all those things at once, you know, what's that like? Yeah. So I, uh, here a couple years ago, I got, uh, a guy contacted me. His boys were getting getting into racing. His name's Robert Lee, but um, he he's like, hey, uh, you know, my boys are getting into racing. I want you to build some quads. And so I've kind of opened up this other, you know, aspect of my business of building race quads, which is, you know, that's what I love to do. I get to I get to build build it and then see it go to the track and perform and through that man it's it's been such a such a uh rewarding relationship it's not just 
a a, a business deal. It's it's a friendship. His boys, you know, I talk to them multiple times a week. Um, I talk to Robert uh, sometimes every day. Um, but he he is, um, you know, at one point he he's got his own story, and I would let him tell that. But at one point he did. Uh, lead a youth group and a Sunday school and you know he knows who who Christ is um, but he he has kind of fallen from that you know um, look look to worldly things and uh, it's been absolutely amazing because he's a very successful businessman and he's been able to step into my life and impact my business in so many ways and be the person I need to hold me accountable and I've been able to be that friend for him to you know help him in his walk with life and uh with his trials and tribulations and um and so you know that's that's kind of where I'm at today is is building those quads and then and still building parts but I kind of stepped back from from working with so many pros and just kind of feeding into those um, instead of, you know, working with the pros, I want to build the pro. I want to, I want to take, I want to take the Lee boys and, you know, they're going to go as far as they want to go. I can't ride the quad for them. And I tell them that all the time, but I can provide them the equipment and be the, you know, the brains behind it to, um, you know, help them to lead them there and, you know, hopefully one day, instead of me being uh, number one in, in the country, that I get to help someone become, you know, that very person. And uh, that's I, I feel like that's going to be more rewarding than than doing it myself when that day comes, you know. And I, I don't plan on stopping until I get there. <laughs> so so that's kind of that's kind of that that part of it. And then, um, you know, RJR still still to this day, we're still building foot pegs and heel guards and bumpers and grab bars. And um, so it's, it's extremely tough to keep up. We've got awesome customers that are uh, very understanding and, you know, we're here busting it out seven days a week. Um, I, uh, I love my family. Uh, I love that my wife is so, um, you know, okay. Uh, I don't, I don't know how good we would have it if she wasn't, you know, didn't jump in here and willing to work with me because we we spend every moment every day together, and um, I love it that way. Um, but we, it, it's tough for us. Like we we went to the GNCC there in Georgia, and um, that that's our vacation. That's our, uh, <laughs> you know, that's our that's our time away from the shop. So yeah, working vacation, yeah, right there, yeah. So I'm glad she's okay with that, but uh, you know, we get we got back home, and it's it like I said, it's seven days a week, and um, you know, I don't like the saying, but a lot of people say you can sleep when you're dead, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I know, uh, I know our our mutual friend Kevin Allen. You know, I talk to him every week, and uh, something came up one time about Rylan working, and I said, well, I need to call him and. Right or Kevin Allen's like, well, don't call him now. He's asleep. And I'm like, it's 1130 in the morning. Said, yeah, he gets going good about one o'clock, but he'll work till about 6 a.m. <laughs> yeah, but that's now, a little over exaggerating. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but now, you know, you got you got crew there and you got a little one that, that and the, I called you one day and I said, hey, man, I hope I'm not waking you up. And you're like, no, man, I've been going since 6 a.m. this morning. And I was like, oh, so we, we flip flopped. You know, we went from nocturnal to whatever the opposite of nocturnal is. I'm just kind of blank. Oh, normal. Normal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it's kind of wild. Uh, since Cruz uh, was born, it seems like, you know, the days do start a little earlier, but they don't end any sooner. Like, I don't understand that. No, no. So, yeah, that, it's the best. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's it's amazing, you know. Um, you know, bringing him into this world, we had uh, we had a wild adventure. Uh, you know, when I kind of stepped away from racing, uh, I bought an older uh, wakeboard boat and started wakeboarding and wake surfing, and um, I've got too busy for that anymore. 
uh, as well. But um, I guess Cruz really he 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 loves the water when he's in the shower. I mean, you can get his face wet and everything. He just loves it. Yeah. And uh, we actually the I got to take my boat out two times this year. I didn't take it out at all last year. Um, I say this year. It's it was in the summer, but right. anyway. Uh, the second time we took it out, uh, we were headed home, and we actually went to Greer's Ferry, which is like by you guys. Yeah. yeah. And we were headed home, and Jamie she went into labor at thirty three weeks. Oh, wow. So he loved the lake so much that he wanted to come out. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, there was one time I checked and I said, hey, bud, how you doing? He said, oh, just up here at the hospital. And I'm like, hang up the phone, Riley. Like, no, no, it's good. It's good. Yeah, like, that's that's the time I could actually answer the phone was when I'm sitting at the hospital and not working. Yeah. I could actually talk to people. Yeah. And I'm yeah. like, well, what do I need to pray? Well, just pray, Jamie. We need him. He's not golden brown yet. We need him to bake a little longer in there. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Right. That right there is a testament to who Jamie is. She's yeah. in, she is in the hospital laboring and you're on the phone and she was fine with it. Yeah. She's that's fine with it. That's a different lady right there. Yeah. I knew it yeah. was a different lady, yeah. a good lady to uh, <laughs> to put up with you, Rylan. I'm kidding. Yeah, whenever, whenever uh, they, they slowed everything down, I think we ended up going to the hospital like four times. But uh, finally, whenever he he was really coming for real, she she ended up having to have a C-section, which we were not not planning for. Um, but I had to spend all that time with her dad there. Uh, so uh, all that time on the phone that she has to put up with, I, you know, I got it right back with her dad being there. So <laughs> now he. He's a great guy. He really is. He's a great guy, but I give him a hard time any time, any chance I get. Yeah, that's right. If we aren't, if we aren't picking on each other, well, we probably don't love each other. That's but, that's yeah. the way I always look at it. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Well, man, dude, like this has been awesome, and I know, like, even stepping back into to race, just me personally, you know, when we met up, you had to, oh, another one of your customers, Steve Jones, you had built a bike for him. Brought yep. it to the race, and uh, we were sitting there visiting and talking about the podcast. And you were like, "Hey, man, I want to come on." And that was May, May of last year, May or June of last year. And it's taken us yeah. this long to kind of get everything lined up to where we can do it. But man, I just thank you for for what you're doing and being a, a positive influence, especially on you know the Lee Boys and so many others. Just getting to go to Iron Man and, and watch uh, and watch you interact with so many people. You've definitely got a, a platform there to to really, uh, really make a, a shine a light in the darkness. You know, not that the GNCC world is a dark place. It's not that. But it's one of those things. There's a lot of people that are self-made, you know, and and they can you know think, man, look what I did. And you can be one of those that go, well, you know, God gave you that talent. God gave you those abilities to be successful in that business. It wasn't all you, you know, it, that talent had to come from somewhere and the Lord's watching out for you. So I just, man, thanks for, for what you're doing and, and for giving us some time here tonight to kind of dive into your story and maybe it can, you know, be an inspiration to, to one of our listeners, you know? Yeah, for sure. I, I, uh, one thing I kind of wanted to touch on there with you saying that is, um, when when Robert Lee, when they they kind of got into racing, you know, a very successful guy like that is like, what what's there to gain? You know, what's I don't see no future in racing. Like what I'm I'm spending all this money for my boys to go racing. And I love my boys, but what 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 can they get out of it? And that kind of stuck with me because I'm living proof of what can come from racing. Yeah. And, and that was kind of a thing with, with coming, coming on this podcast is like, you know, I want to share my testimony, share, I feel like it fits right with remain in the race, but, but also for the, for the listener out there that is asking themselves, you know, what, what is it that is there to gain from, you know, spending all this money for my child to race. And I hope that, you know, my, my testimony and my story helps that not that, 
not that the next boy is, or you know boy or girl is gonna build race parts for four wheelers but the work ethic you you learn to go along with it you know the valuable times with your your family you know um and 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 people like you guys going to the races and uh sharing the gospel with people and uh, what's what's better than that, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have a career doing it, so I'm all about it. I love it, you know, and it's and it's cool that that we get to come around something that we love so much in ATV racing um, and get to do it, you know, bringing glory to God, man. That's what it's all about. Well, and the testimony in the community. I mean, you look at how that connected you to the Dicuses and kind of where Timmy sent you and the impact that had, you know, when you were just in a little bit of a rough trial but I'm sure that he influenced or directed you to help restore that with your family. Well, you know, aside from racing, you probably don't have that relationship. Each one of us in here are impacted by racing in some capacity or another. It's a business, you know, I mean, you have a business in it. Um, You know, really we have, aside from the podcast, we're guys who just enjoy doing racing, uh, you know, doing the racing thing, but we, we can say the same thing. Our parents spent a ton of money and really, you know, quote unquote, what was the point? But man, it has like, you know, there's eternal implications because it connects us to so many people. It gives us so many, so much opportunity to say where Jesus said, you know, uh, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Well, it connects us to a huge harvest. It's a community that not only is big in the U S but kind of even spread spreads worldwide and connects us in that community where we can impact um, our fellow man. And maybe that turns into a great business or becoming a youth pastor or a therapist that gets to go back and relive the glory days or a pipeline guy who gets to impact his family who just loves motorsports. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, that's just four stories right here, <laughs> you know, for sure. Summary. So, um, it is super cool to see what what racing can bring from us. I mean, not just from the competitive side, um, but what it it teaches us in life and how it it parallels with the Christian walk. Um, you know, it's it's great. So, man, Rylan, again, um, I'll just kind of piggyback off uh, Super D here and say it's been an awesome time, and uh, I'd like to have you on in the future because. Uh, you know, we've been on here for a little bit, but I feel like we could just keep on going. Uh, great stories just unfolding. So I really appreciate you for taking uh, time and you know, away from your business, away from your family and just sitting down with us and uh, just kind of pouring your story out there. So thank you, man. Yeah, for sure. Uh, one thing I would like to add before I go here, um, I. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't have sponsors anymore because I'm, I'm not was, a racer. You beat me to it. I was about to go, Hey man, who, who, who do we need to thank? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, brothers, Tanner, but who, who do we need to thank? But go ahead. Yeah. But you know, um, in the role I'm in, like I said earlier, I, I've set out a goal in business and in racing, whatever I do, if I can't do it better, then I don't do it. And I feel that I have surrounded myself with, you know, some of the best people in the industry. And, uh, you know, I'm very thankful for those people. I'm very thankful for some of the, some of the people that have, you know, poured into me, uh, like the Robert Lees, the Chris Landers, the Dave Childers, you know, the, uh, Billy Pullen, um, that dude was, a a big, big part of getting me through my divorce and, he didn't even know me. He just called me and he's like, Hey, you know, you don't even really know me, but I'm going to be your best, best friend through this, you know? And, uh, he was my go-to guy and, and we're still friends today. And, um, you know, and, and then the, the industry people, you know, uh, like I said, I build, I build quads. I try to do the, the, the best, you know, the best builds there, there is, I probably take it too far, but, um, we don't, we don't do it at 90, 90%. We do it at 110%. And, uh, you know, I'm extremely thankful for, you know, people like Mark Baldwin, uh, Micah McDonald at Axis Shocks, uh, Mike Walsh, you know, all these people are, uh, personal friends, you know, Jody Bateman and, and JB and, 
um, you know, Casey Greek or taking care of me on the tire ball stuff. And, um, man, just, just everybody that, you know, hire me at PEP performance tuning. Um, you know, I know Mitch, you know, a, a lot of these guys and, yeah, yeah. um, I, I definitely couldn't do it without them. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm glad to call them friends. I'm glad to, to work with these people and, you know, anybody listening to the podcast, um, you know, I think, I think what they do speaks for itself. And, you know, if you're, you're in the market for, for any kind of parts or whatever, you know, look, look those guys up. Yeah. I mean, you've surrounded yourself from the top quality. I mean, that's what, that's what you have to do. If you want to be, if you want to be the best, you need to surround yourself with the best. And you've definitely done that with the, with the group of people that you have. And I'm just going to piggyback off that and say, you know, we've talked this in remaining the race. It's important of who you surround yourself with, uh, because those people will influence you. So you are surrounding yourself with top people in the industry. And so you are just influencing one another to up your game, to to just take it. You're already at the top, but just to push the top even that uh, much further up. But likewise in life, you need to surround yourself with with people who are going who are going to push you, um, who are going to direct you in, in a positive avenue. Um, you know, you you shared with your friend as you went um, through your, through your divorce. I mean, we need, we've got to have those parallel relationships, um, here, um, here as we walk the earth and why not surround yourself with people who, who love the Lord, because that's of utmost importance, right? Um, and For even, sure. you know, even if some of the people you surround yourself with aren't, uh, Jesus followers, you have the opportunity to plant that seed and, and show them who he is and what he can do for them. Mm-hmm. I just love that, you know, through all this, we've been able to kind of all reconnect around at the racetrack. I mean, our relationship started at the racetrack. Here we are years later at the racetrack again. You know, man, I I love it, you know, getting to do what we do. And even our good friend Bud and Kevin Allen and all those guys, man, it's just those are your lifelong friends. You know, I mean, I hadn't talked to him. Called Bud the other day. Hey man, what's up? Uh, hey, I gotta go. No big deal. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Okay, you know. And it's just, <laughs> I love that. And that's what the you know the racing community is all about. You know, helping build your brother up and keep moving them further on in life in a positive way. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, with uh, it's funny you kind of you bring those two up. You know, um, growing up, me and Bud, you couldn't hardly separate us. You know, and and uh, now uh, I. I couldn't do it without Kevin Allen. That dude comes up here and yeah. we bust our butt and build quads together. And, uh, we, I think we both overextend ourselves and do, you know, try to do too much, but yep. I definitely, I definitely couldn't do it without that guy for sure. <laughs> that, those are great friends and that's what it's all about. But well, man, Ryland, thank you. Thank you so much for the time. And, uh, man, uh, we're just going to keep plugging along and, one of the things about RJR is you can know you you know that bumper when you see one. It's just got a certain look, and I love it. And I got I think I think I got a stack of parts at your place somewhere. Uh, well, you've yep. been busy, and I've been busy, and but hey, we'll, we'll get together and put a quad together here someday. Maybe I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, all right. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll have to. You have to get me back on, and I'd like to you know kind of discuss the the GNCCs and what's going on. And, you know, I, I probably got a little bit more insight on yeah. some things and Be uh, shoot e- yeah, even the TT world. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm working, working with Keister this year. Uh, yeah. We're doing some stuff there, some custom stuff that uh, no one's really ever seen before. Uh, you know, try to get him back on top and, and then, you know, Kevin Allen with the T his TT program, we're working together there. Uh, we hope to get this builder's brawl bike done and, uh, you know, and then I'm still, you know, in the, in the GNCC world still, I, I would say that's my bread and butter, you know, right. so that's for sure. Well, we're looking forward to it for sure. Yeah. Well, Ryland, thanks again, man. Go get some sleep. You got a lot of work to do. Quit talking to us. 
<laughs> yeah, well, sounds great, man. We'll talk to you guys soon, and I appreciate you having me on. All right, sounds All right, good. Sounds good. Right. Thanks, Rylan. See ya. See ya. Man, I just want to give uh, Rylan a big, big shout out. Thank you for taking some time tonight. I know. <laughs> He's got a, a motor that's blowed up, and he's uh, got to get it pulled out of the frame tonight. Got to get it in a crate to ship off tomorrow. But, man, what a great interview, guys. That was awesome. Yes, it was. Agreed. Um, what, a, what a great story. Um, I thought this, when we were putting this podcast together, this is what I dreamed of. Yeah. Our stories like this that you just sit back and just kind of wow, I just uh, want more, I want more. And that's what I was feeling kind of through the entirety of that interview. I know we had to wrap it up at a point, um, right. but I think you get a good picture of the life of RJR, um, of Ryland, um, or, you know, maybe the Cliff Notes version. We got we got deep into yeah. some of it for sure. Uh, but man, I, I really enjoyed it. And I love to see uh, stories like that come together and how God just kind of works everything together. And uh, yeah, super cool for his willingness, you know, to absolutely. Well, and what's funny, guys, is, is I kind of touched on it there a little bit. But when I went to the first cross country last year, just our local little series here, me and Ry- I almost missed the race because Ryland's like, man, I've been listening to every episode. I love what you guys are doing. And he does not like it when you're not on here, Ryan. <laughs> he hates that. Um, and he said, he said, dude, this is going to be weird, but I think God wants me to share my story. I said, I think that's awesome, Ryland. You've got a great, that, that's a great story. I'm, mm-hmm. We're totally on board with that. And it was, he said, well, let me, let me kind of pray through it some more. And then here we are, you know, not quite a year later, but, you know, down the road quite a bit. And, uh, you know, even a few months back, he's like, hey, man, I'm ready to go. I've got some notes <laughs> typed up. And he said, now, it's going to take a while. And I said, that's fine, man. We, we got all the time in the world. But it, I, I'm so glad he was able to, to get through that and, and share with us. And I don't know if you caught it there. We, we were watching him here on camera, but... Boy, he loves his family, and you can see that at the end. You know, he's got a his wife Jamie is is amazing. She's awesome. She she's she re, she keeps RJR going, that's for sure. And then they've got two wonderful kids, and then Mark and Shara right there. Just an awesome family. Love love all those. I know my wife has got to do some business banking loan stuff, yada yada that we don't care about in ATV racing, but he's got to work with his sister some too. So we're we're definitely connected with that family, but. Man, great interview, and uh, yeah. Y'all got anything to add before we wrap up 21? Episode 21, this is the standard, baby. Yeah, this is, this it, is it is funny. As soon as we hung up, Mitch, you said, this is what I want this to be. Oh, this is yeah. this is what I want this podcast to be. Yeah, most definitely. So most definitely. Enjoy. Enjoy, yeah. Enjoy, enjoy, enjoy. Well, that's it for this one. We're going to retire from the race and uh, we'll be back here in a couple weeks so thanks for listening and we'll catch you in the next one